yesterday we had a look at um, the cap space and how much space that there may or may not be. You can see right over Shia. Um, if you are listening on the podcast, you cannot see right over Shia. But um, doing what I felt was somewhat reasonable, which is restructuring Rodgers, extending Devontae, restructuring Bakhtiari, extending Amos, cutting Preston, restructuring Zedarius, uh, getting rid of Kirksey and Lowry and Wagner and Burks and a couple other smaller level guys. We were able to free up about uh, $28.6 million. I mean, uh, excuse me, we didn't free that up. Um, we actually freed up $56.8 million, which gave us a positive cap of 28.6. We figure about 8.253 to pay the draft class. We'll take $6 million just sitting in the bank, which leaves us $14.34 million. Obviously, a lot of that had to do with can we afford to get J.J.? The answer to that essentially is yes. Um, I don't know exactly what he's going to cost. And so I don't know. Exa- you know, it's hard to figure all that out. But here's the other question. Let's say J.J.'s off the table. What about some other free agents? We've heard Brian Gutekunst talk about free agency as though there's no doubt in his mind he's looking at free agents. So we got to this point, again, realistically, um, now with the expectation that we've got about 14-ish million dollars to throw at free agents. And it doesn't have to be the highest priced free agent in the world, J.J. Watt. It can be. Or we can look at it and say, look, let's keep Lindsley. Um, not even sure which other ones I even want to keep at this point. I know Aaron Jones is great. I don't know if it's a prudent decision. Whatever. But we got some free agent options. So what we're going to do today is, again, the way this old brain works here, we're going to go position by position and um, take a look at a couple free agent options and just see what's out there, what kind of fits, what kind of makes sense, what kind of feels good in the moment, and uh, that'll that'll be the day. That'll be the end of the day. Thanks for joining us. All right, so I, to start off, I want to skip um, quarterback because, no, that's we're, we're good with that. Um, let me turn this back up because it seems – awfully quiet we're going to skip that because that's just not a thing but let's move on to wide receiver and this is really tough for me um and i know it's not tough for the packers they have a plan they know what they're doing i was stunned to find out that they wanted to go after will fuller last year i've been trying to to think through this there's a certain number of ways that you can attack this and all of them are problematic to me Let's start from the idea that, hey, let's just uh, let's just take care of this in the draft. It's possible that this is the philosophy they had last year, right? Because as I thought through what made the most sense to me, it's like, you know what, that kind of sounds like what they did last year, and it kind of got them into a little bit of trouble. The thought process I had was the guys that are out there are not the greatest value. I don't like the value of these wide receivers at all. There's guys that will absolutely change – the way that our team is, and they're way too much money, and we can't afford them. There are guys that we can bring in for slightly less, but still kind of a lot, and I don't know that they're better than the guys that we have, and then there's guys that are cheaper that, what's the point? They're going to sit on the bench. Um, And so my thought is, let's just, you know, we'll go to the podium and hype up the guy. No, 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 we really like the guys we have, and then we'll satisfy it in the draft. And, And here's the thing. We know that the Packers had guys in the first round, wide receivers they wanted to draft that were gone which is why they decided to trade up and get Jordan Love, because it's like, well, look, our, our everybody that we like is gone, right? There's nobody left. Let's go up and get Love. Second round, we know for a fact that there were wide receiver targets that they liked. They were gone by the time they picked in the second round, so they went with A.J. Dillon. Third round, for a fact, there was a wide receiver gone. Um, in fact, we know who he is. He went to the Baltimore Ravens, because they kind of said, well, there was somebody we were targeting in the third round, and he went shortly before, and there was only one wide receiver that went shortly before um, – the Packers, and that was the guy that went to the Ravens. I always forget his name, but I really liked him, and he's doing some pretty good stuff over there. Um, so it, it's possible that that they're looking at it and saying, we can't have the same strategy again, to just sit back and say, well, you know, we'll take care of it in the draft because I don't really like any of these free agents. But the problem is I just I can't get excited about any of these guys. The number one name that's going to make the most sense is Will Fuller. They were targeting him last year. The Texans decided, no, 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 we're going to hang on to him. You're not giving us enough. And then as soon as the Packers backed out, he got busted and suspended for the rest of the season. So how did that work out for you, dummies? Um, 
And so they're they're purging everybody right now. They don't have any money. They don't have anything. Um, they're trying desperately to hang out to their quarterback. It's possible they try to keep Fuller around just to keep Watson around. I don't know if that's going to work out for him, but um, it's entirely possible that Will Fuller does leave. And then the question becomes would the Packers be willing to go back in now I think the biggest question for me is were they planning on doing a long-term contract with Will Fuller or were they just looking at it and saying look we got a little bit of money sitting here let's just um, pay the man for one year and then we'll just drop him after one year which I thought would have been insane you give up draft capital for one year rental that that doesn't make any sense to me Um, and again if that was the case I don't think the Packers get him because he's not going to sign a short-term deal. He wants a long-term deal. He's 25 years old. He's he's an incredibly talented wide receiver, and he's, he's going to get offers for multi-year, lots and lots of money. So the Packers would have to do that for long-term, but I just don't know how you do that. We're about to extend Devontae. We can't have two unbelievably high-priced wide receivers. That doesn't make any sense. On top of having one of the highest-paid tackles, one of the highest-paid quarterbacks, we're about to have probably the highest-paid cornerback soon. It's just there's too much. I mean that's one of the benefits of having one of the one of the best and most talented teams, um, is that well it's that you have one of the most talented teams right you got like number ones number twos number fives though the the top of their position we got those guys everywhere, the problem is you have to pay them so we can't be bringing in guys and paying them big time money either it's we we already have too many guys that are way too good that are causing problems for us, um, and and they're drafting well I mean at at some point. Savage is going to get paid. At some point, Jair is going to get paid. At some point, Rashawn is going to get paid. At some point, Elton is going to get paid. We can't be just signing these guys to four or five year contracts. I mean, imagine if if Fuller comes over and let's say he costs seventeen million dollars and we only take eleven in the first year. That means at some point he's going to be getting twenty two, twenty three million dollars, and that's right at the time that I'm saying these guys. Imagine how much Jair is going to be getting paid at that point. Imagine how much Bakhtiari's contract is going to be at that point. Imagine how much Aaron Rodgers' contract is going to be at that point. We're talking, what, $38 million? It's too much. It's too much. Um, and on top of that, what, what did I say we freed up? Like $14 million? We're going to pay him 11 That's That's it. That's all of it. Um, and then if you go down from there, you've got guys like Sammy Watkins, Marvin Wilson, Curtis Samuel, T.Y. Hilton. They're not terrible options, and a guy like T.Y. might make a little bit of sense because maybe you get him for a one-year contract. And by the way, let's not forget we have Devin Funches. We can we can cut Devin Funches if we want, or if we liked him for a reason, for being that kind of guy, cool, then we get to hang on to him for a pittance. It's $2.2 million um, to, to keep him. Uh, that's how much his, ca- his cap hit is going to cost. Or we can cut him and it saves one point two. But Devin Funches is the exact example of a guy that I look at and go, I don't know that he's better than Lazard. Is he better than Lazard? I don't know that he is. So I don't really know that he provides a ton. But if we're going to do it, yeah, let's sign him for a million bucks. And and the point is, T.Y., Curtis, Marvin, uh, Watkins, these guys are like $10 million a year. No way in the world am I paying guys that I'm saying, yeah, maybe they're a little better than Lazard, $10 million a year. No chance in the world. Three, four million maybe. But they're not going to take that much money. No way. Now, maybe they look at T.Y. and they're like, no, he's still got a lot in the tank. He's 31. Let's get him a one-year, $9 million contract or something, and I think he can really pop off. All right, cool. If you think that that's the case, fine. I just, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm just being too cheap, but I just, I don't think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, You know, especially when Alan Lazard plays a really big part in this and as dumb as it sounds with his run blocking and whatnot, they're not going to want to take him off the field very much. He's going to be on the field a lot, and Devontae's going to be on the field a lot. So we're talking about a guy that's not on the field every single play. Um, I, I just I really feel like the draft needs to be where it where it happens. Um, I'm not super in on it. I mean, am I going to do a, a, a backflip for the first time in my life if we get Will Fuller? Yes, I am. I will break my neck doing a backflip if we get Will Fuller. But that's just because I'm looking at it going, hey, they figured it out, a way to do it with the salary cap. Cool, congratulations. I'm looking at it from my standpoint, saying if you're the GM, are you doing it? No. Probably because I'm just too stupid to figure out how to make it work, but you let me know how that works. You let me know how we're going to pay Devontae, and we gave Amos an extension, and look how much Bakhtiari is going to get paid in in two years, and Rodgers is going to get paid in two years, and Jair is about to get paid in two years. How do you get all these gigantic contracts? Oh, Will Fuller also is getting $21 million a year. 
you make that work. I don't know how to make that work. Um, so I, I don't think wide receiver, not to say that they won't go out and do something for a wide receiver. I just would be surprised if it's something really exciting. I would. But, but again, at the same time, they would not stop calling about Will Fuller. And they had been doing that prior to the start of the year, apparently. They've been bugging the Texans about Fuller since forever. They want him real bad. So it's weird because it's like that makes the most sense but also the least sense to me. But if they can figure out a way to do it, if they're good with that, if they feel like this is the thing that's going to get us over the hump, they might go ahead and pull the trigger on it. So it could happen. Again, we got to see how much they do with the salary cap, how much money they're able to free up. Maybe they free up more than I had said, More maybe they do less than I had said. But um, I'm just not anticipating a lot of big free agent wide receiver moves, I guess. So I'm also going to skip tight end. Um, and I want to look at the offensive line, and I'm just going to do this as a whole because it, it really just is kind of a question of who stays and who goes. And as I'm looking at it, you know, one of the bigger-named interior guys, and the good thing about interior is they're going to cost a lot less than, than a tackle, right? The best guard in football is going to be just north of $10 million. The best tackles in football are, are around $20 million. So it's a massive difference. And so it, it makes a lot of sense to say, okay, let's say we move on from Wagner, we push Billy Turner out to right tackle, which doesn't get me super excited, but it's something, right? We can we can draft the tackle, whatever, and try to develop him behind Billy Turner and see how that all develops over time. But going out in free agency and paying the top tackle in football or somebody that we believe can be built better than Billy Turner is just it's too cost prohibitive. Then I looked at it and I said, okay, what about a guy like Scherf? What if we went out and got a guy like Scherf, and then we, you know, if we move on from Lindsley, we can kick um, Elton Jenkins into center. We've got Scherf, one of the better guards at football, and then you know we've 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 got a pile of guys behind uh, Elton and all those. You know, we drafted three guards essentially in the draft last year. Somebody can step up and fill the void at guard, or we draft somebody else and does a competition. But it's still a really solid offensive line. The biggest problem I have with that is we're looking at Scherf getting twelve to thirteen million dollars. According to this, Corey Lindsley's valuation is at, a, is at about 9.7. We're talking the best center in football. We're also talking about a 29-year-old Corey Lindsley compared to a 30-year-old uh, Brandon Scherf. Just pay Lindsley. Pay Lindsley and keep Elton Jenkins at guard. Now, could you pay Lindsley and pay Scherf? Mm, not really. Now, could you pay Lindsley and pay a different guard? Entirely possibly, sure. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what that would look you know joe thuney possibly uh who else we got here um that's basically it on this list so let's see what joe thuney would cost and the only reason i'm saying that weird is because i went to school with somebody that was spelled this way and apparently it was pronounced tooney so i feel like i'm saying his name weird and stupid although i think hers was actually kind of the stupid way of saying it uh, do 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 market value for fifteen million. Get I so I again I just it it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Now, there might be some lower priced guards out there that are available that we could possibly bring in, um, that are just not on this list. But but I'm I'm talking about it has to be clearly better than the guys that we have, and I don't want to pay more than like five million bucks because again remember we're paying Lindsley. That's a lot of money. So if I'm bringing somebody else in just for the offensive line, that doesn't include what we want to do at wide receiver, defensive tackle, edge, safety, linebacker, what, whatever. It doesn't include any of that stuff. Um, I'm not paying a whole lot because I, I think they're relatively comfortable and they can try to do some stuff in the draft and you get some undrafted free agents and you just have a big old competition at one spot. One spot. Because, again, we're, we're paying Lindsley. So we have a left tackle in Bakhtiari. We have a left guard in Elton Jenkins. We have a center in Corey Lindsley. We have a tackle in um in billy turner and we kind of already have a guard so it's just a competition how much money are we going to spend i'm not going to spend a ton so um i i guess what i'm saying is there are options i think the best option is to pay the best center in football Corey lindsley 9.7 10 million dollars it's not even that much he's such a crucial pivotal piece um, it's not even close in my mind. Of, of all the free agents who need to get paid, it's going to be him. Now, the Packers generally don't pay offensive linemen. They did pay David Bak. I mean, I'm talking about that, that third big contract. They did pay David Bakhtiari, but I think there is obviously a difference between left tackle and center. But I, I, if it's me, I'm, I'm paying them. That's it. You know, for, for sub $10 million, it's as big of a no-brainer as there is. And I know Elton can slide in, but 
okay, then it's not about a loss at center, although it may be. It's about a loss at guard. What do we do about that? We'll see. We'll see. Um, I mean, obviously, it's going to save the Packers a ton of money to move on from um, Lindsley, and I'm sure they feel confident in Elton at center, um, and then they feel that they can just grab a guard from wherever. But um, I don't like that strategy quite as much. So we'll see what the plan is. But, again, from my standpoint, as much as these guys are going to cost, and you got a couple other ca- potential cap casualties like Gabe uh, Jackson out of uh, Las Vegas, not sure what these guys would cost. But, um, you know, again, it's it's it just makes the most sense to me to go out. And, and now, again, if you don't, let's say you don't pay Corey Lindsley, are you willing to bump that up a bit? Of course. You know, if we're not paying him the 9.7, let's give it to somebody else. I don't want to pay $15 million for the top guard. That seems insane to me, especially for a 30-year-old guard like a lot of these guys are. $15 million, like, phony. Give me a break. But, um, you know, could you get a quality starter for a short-term contract for, like, $7, $8 million? Sure. Um, but overall, I, I, I tend to think the Packers are going to be relatively confident. We'll see what they do in terms of who stays and who goes. If they keep... Wagner and they decide to pay Corey Lindsley we don't need anybody we have a full offensive line and we have backups we're good and um, you know if I go back to my little sheet here Wagner saved us 4.2 which is a lot that's a lot of money Um, and maybe they can I don't really know possibly he would take a pay cut to stay Um, but otherwise we're talking 4.2 that drops us from about 14.3 down to 10 um so I don't know. I don't know how important that is. Obviously, offensive line is important, but uh, again, I'm I'm stuck on Lindsley. I just let's just pay the man. And again, we're talking 9.7 if we do our same little calculation, which is kind of useless. But just to give a general idea what that would cost in the first year, it would be under seven million dollars this year. So very affordable. It's half the money that we have left based on the money that we freed up of 14.3. So I think that that would be the best possible option. So no, not really excited about offensive. I mean, I'm I'm excited about anybody we go out and get that makes the team better. It just it you know again like I said I want to go through this and just see something that makes me go oh yeah that's it and that just that hasn't really hit me yet. So next up I want to look at running back and this is something that a lot of people have been asking about. Um, this feels right just by looking at it and and maybe it's just because I'm cheap but <laughs> running backs are so unbelievably cheap. Um, and, we, I mean, we get excited about our running backs. There's no question about it. We love Aaron Jones. We love Jamal. Uh, we love A.J. Dillon. We were really big fans of, um, of uh, Eddie Lacy when he was rumbling for a while. I mean, it's just it's, it's an exciting position. And it hurts to think about getting rid of Aaron Jones. But I, I want to just look at something really quickly here. I was kind of stunned to see this, although it kind of makes sense. We know that, that the Packers have been trying to keep Aaron Jones and have struggled to do that. According to Track, his valuation, and again, this kind of makes sense based on what I've been hearing in terms of the offers that he's been turning down, they've got his valuation at about $14.6 million. That's crazy. That's crazy. And, and part of the reason that's crazy isn't because he's really good. It's, it's the gap between what he does and how much better he is than everybody else compared to how much everybody else is asking. There's another guy out there that everybody's really excited about. Um, And a lot of it has to do with his ties to being a Wisconsin Badger, but a lot of people have been asking about James White. Now, if you compare Aaron Jones to uh, James White, and of course I got rid of that tab because I'm a dummy, um, James White is actually really impressive. Now, he's not anywhere near as good as a runner, and that's going to be kind of a problem. But I don't know that there's been much of a better receiver at running back than James White period. Um, Since 2015, his receiving grades, and for those that don't know, PFF good is in the 70s, very good is in the 80s, and then elite is in the 90s. Here are his grades, receiving grades since 2015, 86, 81, 80, 83, 85, 84. Very, very good. Um, You compare that with, for example, Aaron Jones. This is always a lot more smooth on the podcast because I can pause it and I can't do that here. His receiving grades, 58, 62, 82, 76. So he had one year where he was as good as James White. One. This past year he was good, but he dropped off below what you get generally from James White. Um, And so, I mean, if you look at the rushing ability, 
that's where Aaron Jones obviously is going to be better off. You've got, for example, um, and, and here's the thing, it's kind of been going down, though, and we, and we know this wasn't his most dominant year. He had some good games and then some not-so-great games, but in his four years, 84, 85, 81, 79, if you look at um, James White and his rushing grades, it's, I mean, it's just, it's kind of bad. <laughs> it's, 40s, 50s, 160, and then 50. So that that's kind of the biggest issue. But here, here's the thing, though. We're talking about Aaron Jones wanting $14.6 million. And remember, A.J. Dillon is going to be our guy. A.J. Dillon 100% is going to be the, the main workhorse running back. James White is going to be a change of pace guy who is a good blocker and maybe the best receiving back in football. His valuation is $3 million. He's 29 years old, and his valuation is $3 million. That's crazy. So, I mean, in terms of, of low cost, and he's not the only option. You've got, for example, Duke Johnson, who is a solid receiving back, played for uh, the, uh, the Cleveland Browns and then the Houston Texans. They've got, uh, they don't have his valuation, but he was making three years, 15 minutes, so five million bucks a year is what he made the last time he got signed. He's three years older now, so his five million maybe drops to four million. You've got Kenyon Drake wanting 8.3, relatively high, but he's only 27. How about this one? If you want somebody that's maybe a little bit um, more of an Aaron Jones type in terms of, you know, he's not just a receiver. We know that he can be a good runner and all that kind of stuff. Um, how about Chris Carson? Chris Carson right now, if I go over to his valuation, wants, I shouldn't say wants, I don't know what he wants, but but SpotTrack has him at about $7.4 million. That's not bad. And this is a guy who, I mean, his running grade, 77, 80, 79, 74, that's right in that Aaron Jones range. Slightly lower, but I mean, it's right in the same range. Uh, 5'11", 222, 458 speed. Um, if you look at her, her, geez, him as a receiver, um, you know, it's been kind of up and down 50, 70, 60, 82 this past year. 7.8 yards per reception. He had 287 receiving yards and four touchdowns just through the air alone. Um, so, again, it, it's sort of like Aaron Jones light, but for half of the money. Um, so, so it feels kind of like a sweet spot for me because you can fill that void not to the exact same degree, but to a pretty large degree for a massive discount, a massive discount. Um, I, I think James White would be fantastic for $3 million, and I would happily do that, largely because I'm cheap. I don't, I don't have any problem with Chris Carson for $7 bucks a year. He is 26 years old. You can give the man a four-year contract, and he can be locked up next to A.J. Dillon for the next four years. I don't know if they would do that, but it's, it's an option, and it's a cheap option. Um, that also brings into question Jamal, but, but even so... I mean, if we look at what Jamal has done, I know we love Jamal. There's no question about it. But just from an objective standpoint, um, Jamal Williams, as a runner, for example, had his best year. His grade was a 78. Um, even as a pass blocker, that's always been kind of his big thing. Um, that completely fell off this year. He was 89, 76, 85, 61 this past year. And, and, and I know he can largely do it, but similar to Aaron Jones, it's like you don't want to fall off in your contract. You're especially at a position where you're looking at it saying around 26 is when things start to fall off. Jamal's almost 26 years old. Um, and then if we look at his receiving ability, which he always gets a ton of praise for, it really hasn't been very good in, in four years, 52, 63, 90, and then 60. Um so in general, he's a good pass blocker. He's kind of a you know, let's see what let's let's see what his actual yards per carry are. So I don't slander the man for no reason whatsoever. Um, exa it's exactly four yards per carry, which just feels right. He is a four yard per carry guy. That's what he is. He's going to get four yards, and that's consistent. And usually he's going to get two, and then push another two yards forward. It just is. And again, I don't know what he's going to cost. If it's four million bucks to resign him. If it's $9 million, no. And I don't know where exactly the line is in between, but it's just it's relatively replaceable. Aaron Jones isn't super replaceable, but again, you can get a, a slightly lesser version with A.J. Dillon as your workhorse back um, for, a, for super cheap. There's no reason to be paying a running back $15 million a year. That's crazy. So the only other thing to add to this is you can get good running backs in the draft, you know? Um yeah, we can go out and spend $3 million on a guy like James uh, James White, or we just draft a receiving back and, and pay 
even less, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean, depending on when he's drafted, obviously. Um, but I, I, I think we're in a good spot. I really, and, and it kind of makes me feel better about moving on from Aaron, which I don't feel good about. I love Aaron Jones. I love Jamal Williams. But if you just turn off the feels and just look at the information, again, depending on what Jamal wants, I just don't see any reason to do it. We, we drafted A.J. Dillon. He's going to be the workhorse. We'll go get a supporting cast to kind of rotate in and out. Um, and, and guys, I mean, quality guys come cheap. So, um, not opposed. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to doing both. I mean, if you get James White and, you know, we got Dexter there and we bring somebody else in and just kind of have a little competition, see how it goes. That's fine. It's again, it's, it's basically free three, three to $5 million is basically free. So I'm feeling good about that. So let's switch over to the defensive side of the ball. Um, I guess we'll we'll eliminate a couple things. Um, actually, there's only one thing I really want to eliminate, and that's edge. As I'm kind of thinking through this, not that it's impossible, but um, I, I think at some point there's just sort of this level of responsibility, and I think it would be irresponsible to go out and pay for an edge rusher. We've invested a lot in it. I don't think it's irresponsible to draft somebody, but um, I mean we we've done so much as far as going out and paying big money to Zadarius, going out and paying big money to uh, Preston, and then drafting in the first round Rashawn Gary. On some level, y y there has to be some some more draft and develop to try to find the the, the backups, right? I, I just I, I don't want to spend more and more and more money, especially when one of the biggest things we're doing is freeing up $8 million, um, getting rid of Preston. We're not going to get much for less than $8 million. Um, maybe you could try to get an upgrade for that same eight million dollars, but we kind of need that. So I just, I'm not interested in even exploring who the available edge rushers are, especially since that that very rarely works out. Um, now again, JJ is an I guess you can call him an edge. He's technically a defensive end in a three four, which would make him interior. JJ is an option. Clearly, he's an option. But um, the way that that would shake out on our defensive line, so we'll look at that when we look at defensive line, should be. Um, Rashawn and Zadarius on the outside, Kenny and um, JJ on the inside, depending on if it's three or four guys, they would, then you would add Kiki or not add Kiki, whatever. Um, and you can rotate that. If it's four down, you could pull Rashawn and put JJ there or pull Zadarius and put JJ there. And, and again, you kind of rotate that way. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking about stand-up outside linebackers. No, I'm, I'm not interested in that. So... We're going to skip that one, and we'll fast forward a little bit and look at some defensive tackles. So I want to start this off just looking at J.J. Watt. Let's just do a J.J. Watt segment. Um, the biggest question for me is how much money is he going to ask for, demand, command, whatever. I read one article. I've been searching high and low. How much do you think he's going to make? How much do you think he's going to make? And I, I only found one, and I don't know if he has a source or if he's just pulling this out of thin air. He was scheduled to make $17.5 million, but remember, they could not. the Texans could not find a trade partner, meaning everybody looked at that and said, no way, no way I'm paying that man 17 and a half, which tells me, generally, I, I don't know, um, not only was he not worth 17 and a half, he's not really worth close to 17 and a half. There is an article, I probably closed it because I'm just dumb like that. Um, nope, it's right here. There is an article here. Um, that is written by Matt Bovey, uh, Buffalo Bills thing, whatever. Here's, here's a little thing that it wrote. Let's start with what Watt's potential salary cap could look like. Before he was released by the Texans, Watt was scheduled to make $17.5 million this season. The Bills can't afford to pay him that, but Watt's market value should be closer, should meaning he pulled this out of thin air, but should be closer to $12 million than $17.5 million. It sounds insane to think that J.J. Watt could go for $12 million. But, again, putting the pieces together, number one, they could not trade him for $17.5 million. Pass rushers are, today are making into the 20s. There should have been no question for $17 million that should be a steal and nobody would do it. Nobody would do it, right? I mean, it's not like it changes the equation in terms of how much money they have to pay. If, if you trade him or cut him, he's off the books. Why not trade him? Because nobody would be willing to do it. Not for a, a conditional seventh-round pick, apparently. Nobody would do it. So that's number one. Um, 
if we slide over to his statistics, I have way too many tabs open here. The biggest concern, well, there's two big concerns. Number one is the injuries. In the last five years, he's essentially played two two seasons. Um, going back to 2016, he played about he played 157 snaps. That's garbage. In 2017, he played 217 snaps. In 2019, he played 469. So that leaves 2018 playing 963 snaps and 2020 1,013. That isn't to say he wasn't injured those two years. Those are just the only two years where he played any amount of significant snaps. Um, that's one of the biggest concerns on top of being 32 years old. So he's 32 years old. He's missed essentially three of the last five years. And then if you look at his statistics, we're talking about a season in which he only had five sacks, which is the second year in a row. In fact, of those last five years, he's had double-digit sacks. Once in 2018, he had 17 sacks, 74 pressures. That's amazing. But again, that's one year in the last five. Um, the last two years, he's only gotten five sacks each year. And then on top of that, it's not even that the pressures are there, the sacks weren't. He had 45 pressures in 581 attempts, which is not good. That is, I mean, anything under 10%, I say, is kind of garbage. 45 divided by 581 is 7.7%. That's terrible. That's really terrible. Here's the, the reason why you feel like it could possibly work and you get excited about it. One of the things that's been circulating quite a bit is a tweet by Seth Walder. Don't know who he is, but he posted a tweet with a little uh, graph. It's from ESPN, actually. ESPN's pass rush metrics using NFL Next Gen stats, blah, blah, blah. It's a little uh, chart, and it has uh, on the x-axis the double team rate and on the y-axis pass rush win rate. And so, obviously, the further to the, well, for you, it would look like this. The further over in that direction, the better. Um, and J.J. Watt is the furthest in that direction because... His win rate is over 0.2% because, again, the pressure rate that I use and win rate is different. You can win, beat the guy in front of you, and not get to the quarterback. So you're going to have more wins than you're going to have pressures. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is he was by far the most double-teamed guy. And as I said before, the issue is that he, um, he had nobody else around him. He's the most dominant guy. He's the one everybody's scared of, and so he gets doubled the most. Here's what's also exciting, Packers fans. You know who the second most double-teamed guy in the NFL was? Zadarius Smith. You put J.J. Watt and Zadarius Smith on the same team, one of those guys ain't getting doubled anymore. So we're talking about, remember, two years ago. So three, three years ago, the most dominant pass rusher in football was J.J. Watt. Two years ago, the most dominant pass rusher in football was Zadarius Smith based on statistics. You put, in 2020, both of those guys were double teamed more than anybody, and their production wasn't great. Put those same guys on the same team, and, and you have to make a decision now. Um, so even if, I mean, if you told me that J.J. That Watt wanted about $15 million a year, it's borderline a no-brainer for me. If it's less than $15 million, if it were $12 million and the Packers were unwilling to do that, I would be kind of stunned. Um, because to be honest, and, and that would come down to their evaluation that actually he's not that good anymore. He did lose a step, and somebody had talked about that. He clearly lost a step, but it's not that significant. He's still dominant. Here's the thing. If you look at PFF's grades, which is beyond the stats, right, they're probably looking at, you know, uh, grades are going to be more telling than the stats, although people usually like the stats more because they think the grades are subjective and that they're kind of garbage. But the, what, what, here's the thing. In the last four years, here are his grades. I mean, 2016, he had a 56 grade. That was when he played 100 snaps. Um, if we leave out that year, let's just look at since 2012. 92, 93, 92, 91, 86, 90, 89, 85. So 85 is his lowest basically since his rookie year. But it's still super dominant, right? That's that half a step that we're talking about that he's gone down. But he's still grade-wise one of the best pass rushers in football and again there's a gap how, how can he be so good but the stats are so bad add in the double team rate and you understand that so all of the puzzle pieces kind of come together so i was not big on jj watt at the time but again depending on the price if we're talking somewhere and, and keep in mind remember what i said about aaron jones aaron jones is wanting in that same range apparently as jj watt the, the whole thing is silly to me the whole thing is just absolutely silly. So, um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm very much interested in this. And it's also going to spoil it for me as we stop this segment and look at other defensive tackles. Um, because although they probably, you can find some cheaper options, I have a hard time believing we're going to find somebody that gets anybody nearly as excited as one of the greatest pass rushers of all time. And it's a shame about all his injuries because he, he literally, potentially when he's healthy, is better than Aaron Donald. And Aaron Donald is, is arguably the best pass rusher of all time. But um, it just, it's, it's going to make it hard. Similar to what I said about wide receiver, it's like, I just, if you can get J.J. for this, why are we getting this guy for that, right? So... We'll take a look at defensive tackle and then move on to some other things, but um, I, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what he commands. Obviously, he's getting a ton of phone calls. That could drive up the price. But everybody's got a price and everybody's got a line, and I'm sure a lot of teams are at, at that same line. And it's also exciting because it really just comes down to the Packers' evaluation. If they look at him and say, yeah, he's still got it, and we draw a hard line at $13 million, and J.J. Watt's looking at offers between you know 13 and, let's say, 15 and a half. Buddy wants to be with a contender and all this stuff. It's 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 not really that hard to see how he ends up in Green Bay. It really isn't. Um, I don't think it's cost anywhere around fit. Even at seventeen, it's not cost prohibitive. It's not great, but just based on the the you know, let's pull it up. Here we go. There you go, right there. You can't see my cursor. Let me go over here. Now you can see my. No, you can't see my cursor. Stupid jerk. There you go. $14.3 million. And again, we can free up more than that. We can free up less than that. But they can make $15 million work with even $12 million in cap space. It's not going to be great. Um, and it depends, obviously, on the long term, how long term it's going to be. I can't imagine he gets more than like a two year contract. But um, I don't know, man. I, I just, I think it's doable. I really do. And the more I look at it, the more exciting it is. And it seems obvious to me the Packers are going all in seems obvious to me they really, really want defensive line help. That's going to massively – it's not just Zadarius. That's massively going to help Kenny Clark. We've seen a massive drop-off in Kenny Clark recently in terms of his produ- – I mean, you know, guys watch him and they're like, no, he's still doing a good job stopping the run or whatever. But it's been super up and down. He hasn't been elite, dominant, great since Mike Daniels left. we got to get a guy next to him that's dominant. Kenny Clark will never see another double team for the <laughs> for the rest of his life as long as J.J. Watt is there. Um so I just, I mean, again, when we look at wide receiver and we say, okay, for that amount of money, what are you getting? And again, go now that we've looked at J.J. Watt, go back to Will Fuller or any of these guys, you know, whoever, and say, how much are we really getting for that? That should be the standard. When we look at J.J. Watt and say, obviously there's risk, his age, his injury history, maybe he loses another half a step, all these different things are risk. But when you look at it and say, what is the upside? What is the potential of this? This absolutely could put the team over the top to being a top three defense in the NFL on top of still having the number one offense in football. That is the standard for $15 million. It just is. And so when we look at Aaron Jones and say, just pay him $15 million, no, never. I'm sorry. Not a chance. Um just not a thing same with wide receiver like it's just 10 million dollars for these guys that aren't doing anything that are maybe as good as alan lazard no get out of my face that's ridiculous so anyways that's it that's that's jj watt all right let's look at uh defensive tackle now and and I, i'm gonna this is taking a very long time so i'm, I'm just gonna try to speed this up a little bit um i want to look at two other guys so jj is an option jj is a, obviously a specific style of defensive tackle he's kind of like a defensive end slash pass rushing defensive end whatever but um there's another guy that supposedly is going to cost about the same amount of money and i want to equally consider it because it's not as exciting but it's an option and essentially you're taking somebody that doesn't have as much raw talent but you're also taking somebody that's younger that's healthier that's productive and we're looking at about the same amount of money maybe Maybe. I don't know what J.J. Watt's going to cost, but Leonard Williams, actually we're looking at two Giants here. Leonard Williams is an option. Um, he was a former first-round pick. He's one of my favorite draft prospects of all time, um, partially because this is when I uh, first started looking at draft prospects and I got super excited about a lot, about a lot of guys, partially because I watched a lot of highlights is, is how I did film study. Him and Jadavian Clowney, man, I got so excited. But uh, dominant guy. I mean, he just controlled everybody in front of him, got me real excited. But he's only 26 years old. According to Spot Track, we're looking at about $11 million a year, a little bit over $11 million a year. And if we look at his production, 
it's actually pretty solid. You don't hear a lot about him, but 6'5", 302, he's going to be similar in terms of he's not ever going to be lining up outside. He's going to be an interior guy, but he's a pretty good pass rusher. He had 62 pressures on 503 attempts. If we do some math here, 503, 12.3%. That's solid. That's that's decent. That's like what Mike Daniels gave you every year. That's, that's Kenny Clark back when Mike Daniels was around, was giving you 12% is solid from an interior guy. He had 13 sacks. Those are PFF sacks. They don't count half sacks, so it's going to be more than whatever stat you're looking up. But 13 times he put the quarterback on his back. Um, that is that is massive. That's massive. The, the year prior it was one. The year before that it was six. So that's a massive jump. Um, and on top of that, a great run defender. I mean, he had a great year. Now, part of that has to do with scheme. Um he came over to the Giants, and that's when he blew up. He had his one of his best run-defending years ever. He had by far his best pass-rushing year ever. 62 pressures was the highest since, I mean, it was his highest ever, but the last highest was 2016. He had 55 and 8 sacks. That was his best year ever prior to this past year. Um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds of how impressed I am with the Giants defensive line coach and all that stuff, but assuming the Packers feel like they can replicate that, and I think they're going to have to because it's sort of the opposite of what I said about J.J. Watt. The stats weren't great, but the grades were. Here the stats are great, but he only had a 70 pass rush grade, so obviously they're looking at it saying he's a decent pass rusher. Um, a lot of these stats must have been kind of schemed, but again, you're, you're getting a young player that you can sign at a long-term contract for. It's not like J.J. where it's like, eh, we'll give him a year, maybe two. I don't know. I'm kind of nervous about signing him long-term. Um but with uh, Leonard Williams, it's sort of a, a lesser version, right? Sort of like uh, what uh, we talked about with Aaron Jones, where you get it's not quite Aaron Jones, but he's he's similar, but to a lesser degree. Um, but again, he's younger, he's healthier, he he plays all the time, 800, 700, 800, 800, 800, 800 snaps every single year. He's consistent. He's in there. He's a rotational guy. He plays all the time. Um, and, um, and and again, this can be long term. I don't know if they want to spend that much money long term. They just paid Kenny Clark. Maybe they don't want to go that route. It's entirely possible. That brings us to another option by the name of Dalvin Tomlinson, who is somebody that actually, similar to Will Fuller, the Packers apparently have been calling about quite a bit, which, in my opinion, gives this a little bit more teeth. Now, he's a different style. of So you got J.J. Watt on one end of the spectrum, who's sort of a defensive end, like a an, an, an edge rusher slash interior edge rusher then you've got uh, Leonard Williams who is an, strictly an interior guy but is a really good pass rusher slash run defender he's just a talented guy on the inside kind of like what you get from Kenny Clark or what you want from Kenny Clark just a dominant interior guy then you go to Dalvin, Tom, Dalvin Tomlinson 6'3 320 ish pounds um, he's more of a straight up run defender um, he's just a, a really big dude and we saw that we brought in Snacks Harrison for a reason if the Packers really just want to go for somebody that's going to be cheaper, but fills a void, which is, I don't know how much he's going to help Kenny in terms of being an, an, another good pass rusher that's going to help free him up or whatever to get upfield, but um, is going to help stop the run. Dalvin Tomlinson makes sense, and he's going to come at under $10 million-ish. You know, we'll see what ends up happening, but Spot Track has him at $9.5 million, so that's a little bit lesser. Um you get to a point of diminishing returns below about $9 million, and I'll admit I haven't looked at everybody, but, again, you look at the draft, potentially you look at guys like Kingsley Kiki that are getting better, and at some point you say it's not really worth spending the money. We just need to perform better with what we have or get somebody in the draft. So um, this is kind of the low end of that, but, again, you're getting a really good run defender. Um, Dalvin Tomlinson is not quite 27 yet, so he's young. You can sign him for a long time. Uh, he'll be there for the entirety of Aaron Rodgers' career, which seemingly is at least the next three years, um, as long as well as some of these other guys that are going to be there for two or three more years. Um, and so you kind of solidify that, and you take it off your needs chart for the draft, right? That's the other benefit of bringing these guys in, whoever it may be. You bring in a J.J. Watt, a Leonard Williams, a Delvin Tomlinson. It's not to say you can't draft a defensive tackle, but you're no longer looking at the first round going, man, we've got about five things that if we don't hit – like really hit we're in trouble um this presumably takes that off that list i don't know for sure if it does or um obviously you never know how these things are going to pan out but these are some different options that I, I i don't mind any of these options i think defensive tackle is extremely important because the defensive front is extremely important and we know we have a ton of talent that we need to be able to better maximize 
And so I'm willing to spend a lot of money to make this thing work. I really am. I mean, we have the number one offense in football, so I'm not as worried about wide receiver, especially considering some of these guys are going to be sitting on the bench. Any wide receiver we bring in either means he's going to sit on the bench or Lazard is going to sit on the bench because we're not doing three wide receiver every single time. We've also got tight ends. We've got running backs. We've got all, all kinds of different things that we can utilize to make the offense go. But a defense, it's just the more dominant you are up front, the better. And we know about in, uh, teams that, that build that way. I mean, the 49ers, when, when Shanahan took over, the, the GM and the head coach got together and they both agreed the way to, to build a team, you start with a quarterback and then you go build up that defensive line and that's how you win. Um, the Packers have the pieces. They just need to get better. And, and, and it really does feel like if you can hit on it and get the right one, one more piece, especially that other defensive line piece because we got Rashawn, we got Zadarius, we've got Kenny. You put that one piece in there, not only is it another piece to help stop the run, by himself not only is it another piece that's going to get the quarterback on his back more often by himself but it's going to make Kenny better it's going to make Zadarius and Rashawn better it just it it not only is he by himself really good but everybody around him gets better and then when the defensive line play gets better the corners get better the safeties get better everything there gets better around that because there's more pressure you can't run it makes you one-dimensional then you have to throw and you can't throw because you're being harassed 24 7 it's just an unbeatable situation um, and so, yeah, I, and again, this is what gets me excited about J.J. Watt. It's not, J- oh, he's just because he's a Wisconsin guy, blah, blah. No, man, and I, I promise I didn't say, <laughs> I was supposed to say blah, blah, blah. It's not a Wisconsin guy, blah, blah. But, I mean, it, it just, it feels like it can be that missing piece, and that's what free agency should be for. You know, I mean, that's, we, we talk a lot about Ted Thompson, didn't do, he didn't do enough or whatever, but he understood that if you're going to go out and get somebody, go out and get somebody. And maybe I'm a little too Ted Thompson-y in my thinking, you know, either get dirt cheap guys or guys that change the franchise forever. Um, but, you know, I just think that if you're going to do it, get a guy that's going to be a Julius Peppers. Get a guy that's going to be a Woodson. Get a guy that's going to be a Reggie White. And it can't always be that great all the time, but, I mean, really transfer. I mean, Julius Peppers was transformational, and he didn't have nearly the amount of talent around him that the Packers have now. They didn't have as good of corners. Clay Matthews wasn't as good as the other pass rushers on the team. Uh, the safeties weren't as good. I mean, it's just it's such a critical piece, I think, um, and it can mean so much. And, again, if it's true that J.J. Watt is $12 million, then, I mean, they need to be on the phone right now, and they need to do whatever they can to free up money um, because I think this can change everything. But, um, again, these are some other options and, and just a different way of viewing things. It's, it's not about better or worse because it just – everything shifts, right? It's maybe not as good of a player, but it's also a better situation with less injuries, longer term, younger, all that kind of stuff. So um, there's options, and I, I think free agency in general, this is where I want to focus, to be completely honest. This is where I'm getting the most bang for my buck. I mean, running back is great, but it's largely just because they come so dirt cheap, and and you get, you know, it's just it's a good value at running back, and I think it's also a good value. And it's not always a good value for everybody. If you don't have a good defensive line and you plop Leonard Williams in the middle of this and he's the only good guy you've got, it's useless. Same with J.J. He's on a team right now where he's useless. Why? Because he's the only good player on that defense, or at least along the defensive front. So they just double-team him all day long. They eliminate him from, eliminate him from the equation, and, and that's a thing. And it, it, it changes for everybody. For some teams, it might just be that one lockdown corner that's the final piece. For some teams, it might be that other wide receiver, or it might be this or that or the other thing. I'm saying... For the Packers, I feel like that that dominant defensive lineman is that piece. It feels like that's the piece, and um, I told you when it, when I when it when it feels right, it feels right, and and this kind of feels right. Um, I'll be honest; I'll be disappointed if they end up getting a Dalvin Tomlinson because I don't know that he is that piece because there has to be a pass rush element to it. Not that he wouldn't massively help the team, and he comes cheaper, and he's young, and he's talented, and all that stuff. I just don't know that it gets us over the hump if he can't also be a, a dominant pass rusher. I think you can get that from Leonard, and I think you can get that from J.J. I don't think you're getting it much from Dalvin, who had 28 pressures on 334 attempts and four sacks on the season, which tied his his season high ever of four sacks, which he's done the last two years. Prior to that, it was 0-1. and one. So um, it's still an option, but it's it's kind of an underwhelming one. So that, that, that in my opinion, that means we still need to address it in the draft and, and find somebody that's a little bit better of a pass rusher. But that's all I got for defensive tackle. So I want to move on now to the cornerback position, kind of leapfrogging linebacker because that's just what I started looking into. Um, I don't hate it. Here, here's sort of the thought process that I have 
the supposedly the new defensive coordinator is probably going to be moving to more of a zone base scheme. Everybody does a little bit of everything, right? So it's it's not like this is what they do all the time. If you're zone, you're always zone. If you're man, you're always man. They're going to have to do some kind of man, but it's going to go from a primarily press man scheme to a more zone scheme. Um, and so the, the, the general idea is I think under Petten you needed to have more dominant corners than you're going to need going forward. Um, that's not that shouldn't negatively affect Jair. By the way, that's a separate thing. Um, again, check out the Packernet podcast. I've talked about that. But um, so so the idea is we're gonna probably move on from Kevin King. There's a chance that the new defensive coordinator comes in and says, "No, man, it's gonna be great in this new scheme." But I don't think so. I think Kevin King kind of makes the most sense in a man scheme. As weird as that sounds, I, I think I've always said that his best attribute is his ability to. Um, cover a guy in man coverage who's just running down the field right a go route it's just it, you're not going to beat kevin king everything else you can probably beat him on um so i don't i don't necessarily think he's going to be the guy but here's the thing i don't think we need a true lockdown it's kind of similar to what i said about wide receiver we have a number one we need a number two and it's it's going to be hard to find for wide receiver at least that balance between not spending too much and still finding somebody who's a number two that's also better than who we already have it's it's going to be tough because we kind of have quality number two is right now right um i don't know that that's necessarily the case for corner though i'm looking at some of these guys and, and of course with all of these guys it depends some of these guys might just get re-signed by their own team right that's that's the first question I'm, I'm not really looking that far into it um we're assuming that they become available but for example william jackson he is expected to re-sign with the Bengals, but he is a free agent we'll see what happens William Jackson, if you compare him to Kevin King, and this is, this is the baseline here, by the way, Kevin King's grades over four years, 51, 56, 62, 50. His best year was barely average. Um, so it has not been very good. Uh, this past year, um, 115 passer rating when targeted, didn't have a single pick. Last year, his passer rating wasn't bad because he had five interceptions and 11 pass breakups, but he also gave up 904 yards, which is horrific. Um so the bar is really low for Kevin King. We just need somebody that's kind of borderline decent, I guess. So if we come over and look at William Jackson, this is a guy that his grades have been 90, 73, 53, and 71. So he had one down year, but otherwise it's been pretty solid. The most yardage he's given up, remember Kevin King had over 900. His worst year was in 2019, 570 yards. Um, 2018, he gave up five touchdowns. That was the most he's had. He's never had a bunch of picks, but I don't really care about interceptions. I really don't. Just don't let somebody get a bunch of yards on you. Take a, If they just never throw at you and you never get a pick, I'm fine with that. Um, has done well in the past with pass breakups. His first two years had 11 and 10, and then it dropped to 10 and 5. So, again, I don't really care. Just, just don't let a lot of passes get past you. And um, as I mentioned, he's been a pretty solid corner. He's a boundary guy. He's not a slot guy. Um, as far as, as individual games, I mean, his worst game yardage-wise was against Washington. He gave up 81 yards and no touchdowns, had two pass breakups in that game. Um, only gave up three touchdowns. So if we, I mean, the absolute worst game he had, I mean, from a grade standpoint, it was Tennessee. He gave up four receptions, 69 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, that's that's like a really bad day for William Jackson. And so it, it's kind of, and he's six foot four three seven. He's got a lot of speed to him. He's not as big as Kevin King, but he's got just as much speed as he as uh, as King does. And so you'd have a lot of speed on both sides of it. But he's also a little bit bigger. Um, his contract, according to Spot Track, and this could be way off. I don't know. Six point three million dollars. So I'm not saying get William Jackson because again, I'm I'm assuming the Bengals are going to cough up whatever money it's going to take. He's 28 years old, whatever. The general point that I have is I don't think it's going to be that. It's just a question of can we find somebody that we want. I don't think it's going to be cost prohibitive to just find a, a body better than Kevin King to come in and just take that spot. Just just make us not horrible. We don't need best cornerback in uh, you know on the market. Everybody wants the big-name guys. Let's go get Richard Sherman, which, by the way, I'm not even opposed to it. Apparently, he's only going to cost $7 million. Biggest reason for that, he missed half the season, and he's 32 going on 33 years old. I don't really want Richard Sherman for that reason. Um, but at the same time, it's like, okay, if he can play for $7 bucks, whatever, right? Um, but th but but that's kind of my point. A lot of these guys are in like the $6, 7 8 $9 million range. It's not that big of a deal. Um, 
if if the Packers view it as dire, which it may be, if Kevin King is gone and we don't think Josh Jackson can do the job and, and we don't think uh, Kadar can do the job um, and we just need a body, let's go get a body. Go get Xavier Rhodes. Go get whoever because these guys can play football. I mean, what is Xavier Rhodes going to cost? Again, may very well get re-signed um, by the Colts. I think he's on now. But Xavier Rhodes, we're looking at his market value, and he just got a, a nothing. So seven point three. So again, seven million bucks. He's thirty years old. He's done a fantastic job for the Colts. If we come over here and look at his PFF grade, I haven't looked at it recently, but I know he was better than he ever was with the Vikings. A seventy-seven overall grade, seventy-eight point three passer rating when targeted. Um, let's see, he gave up five hundred twenty-five yards, four touchdowns, had two interceptions, and ten pass breakups. Um, probably his best year. I mean, statistically, he hasn't had 10 pass breakups since 2015. It's his highest grade ever. But, um, I mean, even on a down year, which 2019 was a bad year, that's kind of, I mean, a down year for Xavier Rhodes is a standard year for Kevin King. So I, I, I'm not even saying I necessarily want this to be the case. If it's the reality that we're going to be sheltering our corners and making this scheme a little bit um, more palatable, especially if we get a guy, let's say we get JJ and we can't afford to get a corner. If we have a scheme that is that is protecting our corners more, where they have less to do and it's less likely they're going to get killed, you know, you probably need better safeties because they're going to be, you know, the corners are going to be playing in the flats more. So if if it's a deep pass, that's probably on the safety a little bit. But um, I'm I'm not opposed to just saying forget it and and we'll figure it out with either again Josh Jackson, which I I don't necessarily want to completely rule him out. He's a zone guy. The biggest problem with him getting drafted was the fact that he's not a man corner and we're putting him in a man scheme. But if we're switching over to zone, we might already have the guy. So I guess my general thought is if, if we feel we need it, I think we can get a really good value. I don't know that we need it, though. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. I don't think we need a big name. If there's a big name for like $14 million, a lot of Packer fans are going to get super excited. I've heard some of the names, you know, Patrick Peterson or whatever more than 10 maybe 11 12 million dollars or whatever that's going to be no it's unnecessary we don't need that but um if we feel that we need something especially in the short term go get a 30 year old guy or richard sherman you know whatever I, again it's not because he's a big name it's not because i think he's still elite although he was very very good in 2019 um but i mean again if, it, if it's a one year seven million dollar deal so what who cares go ahead and do it um but yeah, I, I guess the point is, corner is a it's 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 a good position because I think we're in a good spot, and if we're not, we can get somebody for a good price. So I don't think they're going to do it, but um, there are definitely some some decent options. And and I think if they do pull the trigger, Packer fans are going to be disappointed. But again, given all the information that I just laid out for you, um, I think it's going to be a good thing. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. I don't think that this is the direction that they're going to go. But uh, we'll see what happens. Next up is linebacker. And I'm, I'm kind of just going to come out and say that I'm not a big fan of this in general because I think linebackers are largely um, overpriced. A lot of the top linebackers, especially the guys that we're probably going to be looking for. Um, somebody just left a comment. I got to up my volume. The problem is it starts making like these poppy sounds if I up it too much, even though it's not in the red or anything. But I'm, I'm just, I'll bump it up see how that sounds. Um, the guys that we're looking for largely are these linebackers that are really bad against the run, can run really fast, and can cover, and um, they go for like fifteen, sixteen, seventeen million dollars. I just, I don't want that. I just don't. So you know, anybody that we look at here, um, it's either going to be a case where they're affordable, but I don't think that they're worth all that much, or they're just really not that affordable. Uh, we, there obviously were the um, the Buccaneers linebackers that, that are out there, but they had already come out and said, no, we're not we're not going to make them available. But you got Avery Williamson. And and keep in mind all the prices that we've talked about recently. Avery Williamson, $7.2 million. He got a 52 overall grade. He's 29 years old. Um, terrible coverage linebacker. No pass rush ability, really and is a decent run defender. So he's just a thumping, run-stopping linebacker, which is going to be as cheap as it gets because, again, the NFL doesn't even care about those style of guys. That's sort of my, my general issue with this whole position. 
it's it's incredibly and it's weird because it's like the NFL doesn't put any value into these guys and maybe it's just because most linebackers can't do what they want them to do and when you find them that's when you see the, you know you got linebackers that go in the top 10 they really really like those guys but um everybody else they just don't care about so i i guess that's sort of my issue we don't have the amount of money necessary even if they became available available i don't think to go out and pay for the guys that can do what we need them to do. And, and moving forward with, with the scheme that we have, um, again, we're going to be seeing a lot more Tampa 2 type of uh, offense or defense, which is going to require kind of that speedy coverage linebacker. It's, it's a necessity. The Packers have to find it, which is why they may go out and get somebody. Right Again, we the one guy we have on our team that can really do it is Oren Burks. I don't know about all that. Um and so it just it creates a problem where the draft really is the absolute by far best possible solution um because it's just it's so hard to find any of these guys that can that can that can do what you need them to do. I just got a comment I need to bump up my microphone. I've been having an issue with with this new mic trying to find the right balance cuz first of all there's a lot of background noise. You can hear the furnace probably just kicked on. Maybe not. Um but also I I had it up louder and it was just it sounded so loud and poppy, so I turned it down, and now everyone's like, hey, I can't hear you. I don't know, man. I'll figure it out. Looking at linebacker, the biggest issue I have is they're really not cost-effective. And and there's there's kind of like two kinds of linebackers. There's the guys that can stop the run. There's the guys, well, I guess, I guess three, but there's very few in the third category. The guys that can run fast and cover, and then there's the guys that can do both. And the, the guys that can do both, there's like two or three in the NFL, and they're they're not leaving their teams. Um the issue that I have then is they're just they're so expensive. You look at, for example, who was it? I just looked at somebody a second ago. Um, Avery Williamson. Avery Williamson, the linebacker, is set to make maybe like seven and a half million dollars. He's just a run defending linebacker. Now uh, remember, we're talking about a cornerback for about seven million dollars. Way more important than a linebacker that's just a good tackler. Now, if you start talking about the guys that we actually need for this scheme, this Tampa 2 thing that we got coming out, you've got a lot of these guys that we've seen other teams pay, and we've seen what they go for. They could not stop the run to save their lives. They're terrible run-defending linebackers, but they can run and they can cover, and those guys are making $15-ish million a year. It just isn't very cost-effective from my standpoint, and that's not to say maybe we can find somebody that can do something um, probably some of the lesser coverage guys that can run fast that maybe the bottom line is for me personally, I just think this is something you have to hit on in the draft. It just, it, it seems the price because it's so rare. And I think that's, you know, it, it makes it harder to find in the draft, but I think the price goes up just based on supply and demand. Every NFL team recognizes the need for those speedy coverage linebackers. Um, and they're just so unbelievably rare. I mean, if I go over, I wasn't planning on this, so obviously I'm, way behind but if we just look at linebackers right now based on pff the guys that can cover um let's see we'll make it guys that actually played uh, we've got 19 guys with at least a 70 coverage grade and that's out of 99 19 out of 99 with a 70 coverage grade or higher there's just not a lot of them they're just they're just not out there and of those guys how many of them can actually do well against the run. You had Denzel Perryman, you had Blake Martinez, you had uh, uh, that's it. That's literally it. And 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 both of those guys are fluky. Like you don't expect Blake to continue that. You don't expect Denzel Perryman to be able to continue that. Denzel Perryman, by the way, is an option at free agency. And I talked about him on the podcast. The problem that I have is that he's never been this good before, and I don't expect him to stay this good ever. I mean, he's never had a good coverage grade in his entire career. He's had one other year where he had a good run defense grade. That was his rookie year. Same thing with Blake Martinez. So again, unbelievably rare um, to be able to find these guys. And then you look at guys like Fred Warner and you look at how much money they're making. Um, let's pull up Fred Warner for a second. Again, a, a, a guy that can cover, but not going to do much for you in terms of run defense. He signed a, that's obviously not right. I'm looking at the wrong guy. Whatever. I, I I don't this seems wrong to me. Is he a rookie? <laughs> he must be. I'm thinking of somebody else then. I don't know. Point is he's gonna make a lot of money. And I don't think that there's a lot of options. The, the, first of all, there's just not a lot of options of guys that can do it. And if you find a guy that can do it, 
they're not going to become free agents. And if they do, for whatever reason, become free agents, you're going to pay $15, $16 million for them. So I just don't think that there's going to be a lot of really good options. Not to say that the Packers won't go out and get somebody, but it's going to be a lot like what they did this past year where they went out and they paid for Christian Kirksey. And a lot of Packer fans said, oh, man, this is going to be great. Christian Kirksey's so good when he's healthy, which has never been true. He's never really been that good of a linebacker. He wasn't all that impactful. It's just hard to really get a home run hit with, with a linebacker. So, again, if they do it, it'll be sort of a stopgap. It'll be we just need this baseline guy to try to help us so that we at least have somebody that can kind of do the job, and then hopefully we, we get something better in the draft. I just don't think you're going to find a lot of, of really great help without giving tons of money. You know, um, again, with the names, the, the guy that went to the Jets, they paid – Buku bucks to get that guy out there, and we just don't have that money for a linebacker. I mean, come on. Again, we're talking seven million bucks for a corner. We're talking thirteen million dollars for J.J. Watt. We're talking about all these different things. I'm not paying fifteen million bucks for a linebacker. So, um, I just don't think linebackers a, a, a very good option. And um, if you think there's a really good option, odds are it's probably a big name that isn't actually that good or is just massively overhyped or is going to end up being overpriced. That's my assumption. But feel free to drop a comment of a great free agent that's going to be available that's not going to be super expensive, and I will check it out. But I don't think they exist. The only other real option is safety. Uh, we could go through a list of guys. I don't think it's impossible. The, the problem is if we follow through and, and extend or restructure Amos, and we obviously like Savage, we're looking for a number three guy. I don't think you want to spend all that much money. Um, again, it's not impossible, but it also kind of just feels like from a GM standpoint, if you are going out in free agency, it's kind of like you kind of messed up somewhere along the line. You know what I mean? Especially in this spot where it's like we should have had somebody ready to go. That's that's my job, to make sure that we drafted somebody, we developed somebody, we've got somebody ready to go. And I just I think we do. You know, we've got guys that, that can be that number three. I don't know that it's super dire. I mean, yeah, you could argue that, you know, if you get three really good safeties, you can do so much stuff. You know, you got one, two guys deep. You could have that as as opposed to that linebacker that needs to cover. Well, we can use a, a safety to cover. Or you can put them in the slot or whatever. Like, it just it gives you some versatility that's kind of cool. But, again, with a cash-strapped team that has some other needs, I, I, I think it's possible we draft somebody that can be that number three guy that can be in the box, that can do all that kind of stuff. I'm not, you know... Maybe take a second attempt at getting a Josh Jones, for example, um, that style of, of safety slash linebacker or safety slash slot corner or whatever it is that they want to do. I just I don't feel like partially because I'm kind of burnt out right now. I don't feel like investing a ton of time looking at guys. There's options, but the guys at the top of the list, again, it's just it's too much. We don't need a number one that's going to be on the bench half the time because he's a rotational number three safety. Um so as you get down the line, obviously you get cheaper, but it's also like, I just think we can draft somebody. So I, I don't think it's going to make a lot of sense. I think it'll probably confuse people, and, and rightly so, because we have two safeties that we like. And, and if we do that, everyone's going to panic and say we're getting rid of Amos, which I probably would too. But it just it just doesn't make sense to me. I think this is something that maybe they address in the draft. But um, anyways, I think to recap, um, Offensive line, is, is it, it can make sense, but it just depends what their plans are. Are we keeping Wagner? Are we keeping Turner? Are we keeping Lindsley? Are, are we, what are we doing with all these guys? Once we figure that out, which obviously they know the plan, and it'll probably be the free agency part and then the releasing part, um, but without knowing that, it's hard to really speculate as far as what the best plan is. But again, my contention is, based on how cheap I mean, centers are in general— um, I think the best plan is to keep Lindsley and then just build from there because there's not, once you get rid of Lindsley, now we have a massive deficiency on the interior. I mean, at best, we would probably have to keep Wagner, kick Billy back inside, and then put Elton at center, and then we'd have to promote another guard, which is fine, assuming you're okay with not having very much depth at all. Um, but again, I, I, I would rather we pay a little extra to keep Lindsley and drop Wagner, right? Um that would be my my contention. I obviously I'd rather do all of those things, but I just I just I can't get my head off of we need to keep Lindsley. Um, wide receiver, it's just it's it's not that I don't see a need for wide receiver. It's that I don't really see a good path that free agency solves. 
There's great wide receivers for a lot of money that can absolutely be transformational, which is important. I just don't know that it's cost effective. I don't know that we can afford to pay $15, $16, $17 million for a Will Fuller. I don't think I want to pay for a second-tier guy because although it's nice to have a second-tier guy, why pay $10 million to get a guy that's that's a half a step better than Alan Lazard? Um, and, and cannot do what Alan Lazard can do in the run game, which is as stupid as that sounds, it's pivotal for what the Packers have been doing. Um, meaning this guy that we go get is going to be on the bench a lot. And I just I just don't see how we're going to have a free agent option that's better than the option to find somebody in the draft. Um, running back, I think there's a lot of great options. Uh, the draft is a great option as well, but it, it kind of frees you up, especially if you get a James White to where you at least have that, right? We have James White, who's just a blocking receiving guy, just a third down back. A.J. Dillon is the workhorse, and then we got Dexter as kind of the, you know, the secondary running back type of guy. But also we want to address it in the draft, but it just gives you a little protection in case we can't really get somebody that we want in the draft at running back because we have a lot of other needs and only seven picks plus whatever our compensatory picks are. Um, so I like it. I don't think it's going to be earth-shattering, but it doesn't need to be. We just need bodies, and we need it cheap, and we can get that. We can get talented bodies for cheap. So I do like that option. Uh, tight end I don't think is necessarily worth exploring. It's possible. We've heard about uh, Zach Ertz becoming available, and I think there was some interest from the Packers, or at least rumored to be interest from the Packers at one point on that. Um, I didn't really explore it because we have so many so many options and so many young guys, and, and possibly Mercedes could come back. Or, it's just, there's too much there. Um, defensively again getting that interior defensive line piece i think is the one that makes the most sense it, it's if you get the right guy i don't know that there's a price that's too high i mean there is it's, it's called you can't afford him but um i would be willing even so far as to say moving on from Corey lindsley if it meant getting jj watt if we genuinely believe that he can do the job and that's going to come down to the pro personnel staff making that assessment i tend to think he can um, but it's also short term, and Corey Lindsley would be more long term. So we're we're taking JJ for a year or two and losing Corey Lindsley for three or four years, which is problematic. Um, edge rusher, I'm not interested in linebacker. I just I don't think there's a way to do that in free agency properly. Um, I think it's incredibly important, and I wouldn't put it past them if if they feel like this is a need and 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 this scheme isn't going to work without it. And there's a guy available that we think can do the job. Maybe that's where they sink their money, but it's going to depress me. If we spend big time money, and, and that could be ten million, twelve million, whatever for a linebacker. I'm not talking about year one, but but per year average, for a linebacker, that's just going to be depressing to me, um, because it's going to be a guy that can turn and run, but it's probably not going to help, uh, get, you know, stop the run very much. And and again, that just that bothers me. Um, cornerback again i don't know that it's going to be the best option but it's not the worst either if if it's just that you need bodies i think you can get them and i think you can get them relatively affordably and and again the the bar being better than king i, th- I think we'll be all right finding that um and then finally safety again I, I just i don't really see the point in it um possibly if that's going to be the linebacker substitute i could see them going out and getting somebody but i just don't think that that's necessarily the thing so that's kind of the long and short summary of it. Um, there's a billion options, and obviously there's there's so much that's up in the air in terms of who's going to get re-signed and, and who's going to do what. But um, I will say this, and, and this just came through on the Twitters, um, this via Bill Huber on Twitter. A couple days ago, ESPN reported that about a dozen teams were interested in signing J.J. Watt. The Packers are one. Now, the Packers always call. And if they call and, and, for example, a guy like Ian Rappaport gets a hold of, hey, how many teams have called you, and they list the Packers, he's going to say the Packers have shown interest. A call doesn't necessarily mean interest, but as I've just gone through all the information, I think it may be genuine interest. Um, and depending on price and everything else, I, I think that they may. And again, if they're interested and they can match or even get close to that top offer, I think the Packers are probably top of the list in terms of where he wants to go. Not only is it home, not only is he a Packer fan, but it's it's a genuine contender and and again it is he can be that piece that takes you over the top i I think that is the most important piece so um kind of talking in circles at this point but that's sort of where i'm at with the uh, free agency Uh, i hope that you will check out the packernet podcast if you're not already listening to it if you're listening to this on the packernet podcast please check out the uh, youtube channel etc etc you guys have a great day and i will check you out tomorrow